Bueno, como digo, lo bueno es de esperar, así que el blockchain comienza ahora y espero que disfruteu. Eh, primero de todo, voy a agradecer sobre todo a Darra, que ha tenido un periplo para, para todo el mundo para arriba aquí. Así que thank you very much for coming, for being here. Thank you for eh, la Darra es eh, la profesión, es advocada, bueno, está dedicada básicamente a, es la directora del Centro de Operaciones Concentra Medical Centers a Louisville, Kentucky. Eh, también es de, bueno, la seva formación básicamente es jurista, pero com ya veo ha, ha sufrido el cambio cap a la gestión de la información y actualmente eh, está haciendo una tesis doctoral sobre eh, Transparency and Privacy, Democracy, Freedom and Human Rights in Records. Eh, está supervisada por la archiconaguda Luciana Duranti y está especializada sobre todo en tema de healthcare, eh, que como ya veo también en el blockchain, pues tiene mucha relación y ha proyectado sobre todo a Estonia sobre aquel tema. Y tampoco es muy alargada y supongo que la seva ponencia ya veo cómo va a funcionar. Supongo que fará una breve introducción sobre el tema y del tema blockchain y ya hablará sobre también els, las limitaciones y, y todo, todo, todo plegat, una miqueta. Después espero que surten preguntas, pues es un tema muy interesante, muy como yo sabes, como ya sabes que soy muy defensor de blockchain, pues si tenéis algún duda o cosa o cosa, muy feo arriba y ya, ya verán cómo nos organizan para para hacerme todas las preguntas. Darra. Gracias. Bon dia, that's the limit of my Catalan. When I first moved to Canada, the Canadians informed me that someone who speaks two languages is called bilingual, someone who speaks three languages is called trilingual, and someone who speaks only one language is called American. And so, I will be following in the tradition of my countrymen and presenting in the one language in which I'm capable of presenting. Blockchain. People often assume that when I say I study blockchain, that I am some super geeky techno person who's all about like the um, cryptography and reads code for fun. They are wrong. People are often wrong. I am a hardcore, unapologetic humanist. I used to be an attorney. Now I'm an archivist, and I am a out proud, fiercely advocating type of archivist. So why blockchain? I'm not one who gets super excited about technology because it has cool bells and whistles. I'm interested in what it does for people. If you're going to tell me we have this cool technology and it's going to fix all of our record keeping problems, I'm going to say what problem and how. And so when I first started studying the blockchain, because my, um, one of my supervisors, Dr. Victoria Lemia, had this instinct that this new blockchain thing was going to be a fundamentally record-keeping technology, I had to come up with some way to understand the problem for myself. And for me, I need to understand things not up here, not even here. I need to come down around here somewhere. And the best way I was able to understand the problems that the blockchain solves, wrong slide, is through the movie Aladdin. Because the turning point in the movie Aladdin is when Prince Ali Ababwa reaches out his hand to the princess and says, do you trust me? She takes his hand because she knows that Prince Ali Ababwa, despite his 70 golden camels and his flying carpet, is in fact the boy she met at the marketplace. She knows who she's dealing with. In this new globalized internet connected world, We don't know who we're dealing with. How can you trust if you don't know who's on the other side of a transaction? That is the problem that blockchain is allegedly going to solve. But trust is a bigger problem than just knowing the magic of the math. But before we can criticize the blockchain, we have to understand what it actually is. Raise your hand if you think you are a blockchain expert. Raise your hand if you wouldn't know a blockchain from a Bitcoin if your life depended on it. I was certainly in that second crowd when I started this. A blockchain, though, is based on an idea that we archivists should all know, a ledger. A blockchain is a distributed ledger with a decentralized architecture. And in that distributed ledger, you have transactions that are, theoretically at least, immutable, They're encrypted with public key infrastructure, and smart contracts are an option. Does that sound like complete gobbledygook to anyone? Don't worry. I will break it down 
in my non-math, non-techie way. So what is a distributed ledger? It's exactly what the name sounds like. It is a ledger, just like the ones we've seen you know, in registrar's offices, except anyone can read the ledger and anyone can write a transaction onto the ledger. And the way it works is we have what's called a distributed architecture. And I love this little picture here, because where this comes from originally is the idea of how to secure communications in the case of a nuclear war. Because if you look at our old ledgers, if you look at the way we've traditionally done record keeping, it's in this centralized model on the left. And it, how many nukes do you need to take the centralized model down? One. The middle, decentralized. But you still only need seven nukes. But now look at that distributed network. That's a peer-to-peer -peer network. All of us are theoretically running that blockchain. So if somebody takes me down, the network doesn't fall down. So that's the idea behind a distributed le ledger with a decentralized architecture. It has some inherent strengths. You can take one down without them all falling down. In the um, library community in the United States, they call this locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. But it's not a problem-free solution. It's slow. Imagine you have your ledger. Now you have to rewrite the ledger every single time you want to write a transaction to 10,000 or 20,000 copies. Ooh, we're going to have an exciting time together. <laughs> That's slow, and it takes a lot of resources. Uh, right now, the Bitcoin blockchain, which is probably the most famous one, takes about as much energy worldwide each day to run as the country of Austria. That's a whole lot of electricity. So, immutability. This is one of those key concepts behind the blockchain. Theoretically, when you write a transaction onto the blockchain and it gets approved, no one can ever break it or change it. This is why you have laws like in the state of Arizona that say evidence and records found on the blockchain are the uncensored truth, which is deeply problematic, but there it is. Again, lawyers like to get things wrong. And the reason that they believe that it becomes the uncensored truth is this. When you write a transaction onto the blockchain, what happens is that a thing called a hashing algorithm takes a, a, a fingerprint of that transaction. That fingerprint is a unique 256 character alphanumeric code. You change one, one bit in that transaction, you change that entire fingerprint. You change that entire 256 digit code. Now then, you don't just have one transaction. You have transaction two with its fingerprint, transaction three, transaction four, transaction five, till 10 of them make a block. Then you take all of those hashes, all of those fingerprints, and hash them together to make a handprint, basically. So if you change one bit in any single one of those transactions, you change the fingerprint and the handprint for the entire block. The hash, the handprint for that block, becomes the first hash in the next block. So it's a block that gets chained to the next block. It's very clever, blockchain. However, immutability, you know, the, it's a fantastic idea, immutability, that we can never ever have any forgeries or frauds ever again. Does anyone believe that's how it's actually gonna work? Because who's going to make these records? People. Am I the only person in here who messes things up sometimes? Who makes errors? Well, it'd be nice if I were the only one, but I don't think I'm, we're quite there yet. So what do you do when you have a record that can't be changed and it has an error? It could be a little error, like say, you know, it could change my birthday by one day. It could be a big error. It could get my citizenship wrong. How do we fix something that's immutable? We also have a problem of how do we redact records? There are lots of things in records that we don't want the whole world to see. Uh, in Canada, we have social insurance numbers. In the US, it's social security numbers. Um, 
in medical records. You might want someone to see your medical record, but not necessarily know your HIV status. So we will have legitimate reasons and needs to share records without wanting to share everything in those records. But if you have an entire unchangeable entity where the changing of one bit changes the whole record, how do we redact that? Or how do we go back if a court orders something sealed? Immutability is a problem as well as a strength. Consent mechanisms. Consent me mechanisms are where the idea that blockchain will fundamentally liberate us from the evil hold of government and change the way we interact so that we never have to actually trust anyone, they are ever in, anyone or anything ever again comes from. The idea behind a consent mechanism is simple. Instead of people of figuring out together how a particular, whether or not a particular transaction is good, we will trust the computer to do it. The computers, because we're talking again about many, many computers. How does that work? So if I want to buy a blouse from this lovely young lady here, and I promise to give her $20 to buy her blouse, someone has to make sure I have the $20 before she sends me the blouse, otherwise she's going to get ripped off. So what, how that happens in a blockchain system is instead of you know, a bank or you know, if it were a real estate transaction, a notary or an attorney doing it, People will compete, and this is called the proof-of-work consensus mechanism. People will compete to, to solve a cryptographic puzzle, a big complicated math puzzle. Whoever solves it first gets to look and say, oh, I have $20. And they get to look at her inventory and say, oh, she has that blouse I want to buy. And then they say, yep, this is a good transaction, put it on the um, ledger. The problem with that is that the way people are competing to solve these problems is through the um, application of crazy amounts of computing power. And by crazy amounts of computer power, I'm talking server farms bigger than this room, um, in, in China especially because there are people who can get preferential hydro rates. Um, in Quebec, we recently had some people who cashed out their life savings to set up a Bitcoin mining farm. And it's very energy inefficient, and it also starts to concentrate the power. Because the reason that, these consent, that the proof of work consensus mechanism supposedly works is because no one controls the network. You have tens of thousands of people out there all competing to be the first miner to solve the puzzle. Now then, as fewer and fewer people can afford the energy to run these giant server farms, that power over the network gets concentrated. We call this a 51% attack. Because if you can control 51% of the nodes on the network, if you control 51% of the copies of the ledger out there, you can do whatever you want. And no one can check you. No one can stop you from falsifying records. There are other consensus mechanisms out there, like proof of stake. And this is the one you see a lot in things like um, healthcare records. Basically, what we say is, OK, we know that John is a doctor at this hospital, and Joan is a doctor at that hospital, and they have the expertise to verify these transactions. That starts to sound a whole lot like what we're trying to get away from, which is you know, trusting people and institutions to do their jobs correctly. So consent mechanisms are supposed to kind of shift how we understand trust when it comes to records and record keeping systems. Encryption and public key infrastructure. Public key infrastructure is one of the fundamental technologies that predates the blockchain and underlies the blockchain. And basically, it's kind of an addressing system. So I would have a public key that anyone can see. Because if you, know, you want to uh, transact with me, if I'm going to buy your blouse, you have to be able to address the uh, blouse related information to me. Private keys belong to me. Or to, I'm sorry, what's your name? Carla. Carla. So if Carla wants my 20, the $20 that I'm sending her, she has to sign into her account. She has to open her lock with her private key. It's kind of like your door. You know, anyone can see where your house door is and put mail in the mail slot. Only Carla can open the door because only Carla has the key. 
That's public key infrastructure. One of the big problems with people misunderstanding the blockchain is that a lot of people think that everything on the blockchain is encrypted because blockchains use encryption. And that could not be further from the truth. Only the things that are designed to be encrypted are encrypted. If you look at the Bitcoin blockchain, there's social security numbers, there's birth dates, there's every kind of imaginable uh, personal data out there sitting on the public chain in plain text. Anyone could read it. It's not encrypted at all. And it's out there immutably forever on tens of thousands of computers. So, then we have what? So I just gave you a whole bunch of jargon about this system and what's probably most of your all's fourth or fifth language. What does it mean? One, blockchains are disintermediated. The idea behind the blockchain is we don't need lawyers and notaries to handle our real estate. I can buy Carlos' house and we can put it on our blockchain and everyone will live happily ever after. And we don't have to pay lawyers and we don't have to wait for them. Has anyone there ever met a really fast lawyer? Because I sure haven't. We also have this idea here that I don't have to know tr Carla. I don't have to trust her. She made the mistake of telling her, me her name, so I'm going to pick on her the rest of today. Um, but we can still transact, and we can both see what's happening on the ledger. So we can trust that neither of us is about to you know, lose in the deal or get cheated. We trust that the computers will take care of us. And finally, everyone can see the database. Even though some stuff in the database is encrypted, and you can't necessarily see it, I can't see Carla's private key, we can see the database itself. And theoretically, this is supposed to make it so that we can all have a measure of transparency and control. You know, this whole open government idea that, you know, if we could just see what the bad guys are doing, then we can stop them from being bad guys. The blockchain has some of that baked into it. And so does any of this matter? Is this not just, you know, some geeks playing in the basement? The truth is blockchains are being tested in a whole lot of interesting use cases right now. Uh, the government of British Columbia, where I live, is rolling out a blockchain-based system for all of their business licenses and all of their, rest, you know, liquor license, restaurant licenses, that sort of thing. Um, one of the projects I work on is looking at the blockchain for genomic data. Specifically, we're looking for biomarkers. Because right now, when, after you have a transplant, a heart transplant specifically, you have to go in and get opened back up 16 times to draw a biopsy to see if you're rejecting that heart. So you get your transplant and then you get, you know, an extra 16 surgeries that year. What we're trying to do in this project is to look through huge amounts of people's data to find that that one protein, that one marker out there that we can look at and see who, who's rejecting or who's not rejecting a heart through a blood test without cutting people up. But that means looking at a whole lot of really personal private data. So how do we do that? How do we keep that data safe and still use it? So that's one of the things that we're looking at using blockchains for. Brazil is now testing a blockchain for their land registry because they have huge problems with corruption in their land records. We're seeing blockchains tested, tested for supply chain management. So a Walmart, um, not a CEO, a Walmart manager, I'm trying to remember what you call the guys, in the, some muckety-muck, a Walmart muckety-muck, challenged his team. He said, find where this tray of mangoes came from. And it took them about two weeks to track it down through the supply chain. They put in a blockchain-based supply management system. Does anyone want to guess how long it took them using the blockchain to find out where those mangoes came from? How long? It took two weeks before. No guesses? Oh, come on, you guys are no fun. Three seconds. They scanned the code and they knew exactly which farm those mangoes came from. One of the more interesting blockchain cases I've heard of is smart weapons. So in the United States, we have a fair number of what are called officer-involved shootings, where a police officer shoots a civilian. One of the things that needs to be determined in the investigations around these shootings is, did the officer hesitate? Did he stop and think, at least for a second, before he drew his gun and shot that person? 
With smart weapons, which use a blockchain so that the data can't be tampered with by, say, a corrupt officer, they can see to the microsecond how long that gun stayed in its holster and when it came out and when the person was shot. So there are a lot of potentially good applications for the blockchain that are being tested. Will it save us all? One of the big claims you hear about the blockchain is that it's this transparent, democratizing, it's, you know, it's going to save us all and maybe bring us a coffee when it's done. <laughs> I am skeptical about that claim. Why? Because blockchain is, I would argue, a record-keeping technology. And I'm going to borrow a provocation from the American constitutional scholar Lawrence Lessig here and say, records are law. Not necessarily in the sense that, you know, records are passed by legislatures to, you know, prescribe behavior. But in the sense that records regulate how we do, uh, how we do things and what we do. So Lessig had what he called the pathetic dot theory. And it's the pathetic dot theory because at the center of that circle is you and me. And we're all little tiny pathetic dots. And we're little tiny pathetic dots because we're all being regulated by these four forces. Legal forces, the actual law, technological architectures, and uh, Lessig was writing in the 90s, of course, about the dawn of the computer age, um, economic forces, and social forces. And it's a very popular model in information sciences in North America for good reason. But my colleague and I took some issue with the idea that we're all pathetic dots with no agency. And so this is kind of our model, because we say that these forces, yes, they all interact. Your economic, your social, your legal, your technological contexts all matter immensely. But we matter too. We respond to and we um, help regulate these forces in return. And it works at different levels. So you have you know, the little personal pathetic dot in the middle, but there's also group forces. And then you have that sovereign level that, of course, lawyers like Lessig are thinking about. And this matters a lot when you're thinking about something like the blockchain, because technologies don't emerge from the ground. You know, they don't spring from Zeus's head fully formed. Technologies are made by people. They are used by people and they are formed by the context of the people who make them. Blockchains emerged from this crypto-libertarian ethos that says, basically, governments are bad and all we need to be free is to get rid of the evil governments. And it's also got a strong economic force regulating it. And the blockchains are not synonymous with cryptocurrency, but they arise from cryptocurrencies. And so when you look at the um, blockchain solution for the land registry in Brazil, that's being built on the Bitcoin blockchain. What happens when all of your land titles are financialized to a currency that has had swings of $16,000? What does that do for the stability of your record keeping? What does that do for the stability of people's rights? What happens with, if the Bitcoin becomes so unprofitable or if the economic forces behind the hydropower, the, the electric power behind the Bitcoin, lead to a 51% attack that makes the Bitcoin vulnerable, that makes it capturable. What happens to people who are relying on those records for their land? So when we think about these technologies, we have to, I believe, reject a sort of naive techno-utopianism, that if we just find the right technology, the magic bullet, that it's going to save us all from all of these problems. Because fundamentally, these are human problems. These are two separate women. On the right, or your all's left, my right, is Rebecca Schaefer. Beautiful young woman. She was an actress with the whole world in front of her. Unfortunately, at the time and in the place where Rebecca Schaefer lived, driver's records were public records. All you had to do was walk down to the Department of Motor Vehicles, pay $2, and get a copy of the driver's record of anyone you could give the name for. A stalker got Miss Schaefer's driver's record, came to her apartment, shot her in the chest, and killed her. 
She lost her life in part because the record-keeping apparatus, the record-keeping technology in Los Angeles County had drawn the wrong ballots. On the left, we have Teresa Rice. She was an indigenous Canadian woman. And for those who don't know, Canada, up until 1996, had a practice of taking indigenous children from their families by force and putting them into residential schools where they were physically, sexually, and emotionally abused. Their language and culture were literally beaten out of them. And many of them died. Indigenous children in residential schools in Canada had a higher risk of dying than soldiers in World War II from Canada. Ms. Rice is seen here with her brothers, and she's a lucky one. She never saw her parents again because the Canadian um, school that took her lied and said her parents were dead. But she's one of the few people for whom records were available. And as an adult, in some 30 years later, she was able to be reunited with her brothers. There are some of only a handful from the residential school in which they were enrolled who were able to do that. In their case, because Canada made the records unavailable, people lost families, language, and culture. Getting the balance right is a human problem that goes far beyond what technology we use. And when we start looking at new technologies like blockchains, we have to keep these very human questions and costs at the forefront of our minds. So, evidence. I know, a bit of a shift in tone here. Why do we do what we do as archivists? Why do we keep records? I believe it's one of the most important jobs a human can do, and here's why. We preserve trustworthy evidence of past acts and facts. And that provides a foundation for future decision making. Without evidence, people can't assert their rights. If I didn't have a record such as my passport, my birth certificate, I couldn't assert my rights as a US citizen, my rights as a landed immigrant in Canada. That has an enormous impact on my life. But right now, what we're seeing in the case of blockchain and also algorithmic decision making systems such as um, the neural nets we heard about earlier and um, other forms of artificial intelligence. We're seeing the sort of dis um, control over evidence, the understanding of evidence as a relationship between something to be proven and that which proves it abdicated to these almost inaccessible systems. We're seeing the loss of, or at least the alighting of human agency in our evidence apparatus, which sounds very gobbledygooky. So let me talk about it a little bit more. One of the most fundamental principles in archives, of course, is provenance. We organize records, you know, we have respect for original order, we keep records with their uh, creators. Why? Because they re the context of those records and their creation tells us something. It tells us about the creator. What we are seeing now in these blockchains and in these uh, algorithmic decision-making systems are what I like to call font filius nullis, which is the legal term for a bastard font. A font without a parent. Because who is the parent? Who is the creator of a blockchain record? Who owns that ledger? There's 10,000 identical copies of the ledger out there. Who has power over it? Who has authority over it? And if no one has authority over it, how can it be reliable? We have no context for making those decisions when it comes to blockchain records. We also are running into brand new problems because these new technological architectures are re-regulating the way records work. And so we are seeing, in addition to this sort of distributed or collective creation in the blockchain, this creation by non-human entities. And we're seeing you know, the problem of what Malcolm Todd, a Canadian archival scholar, calls the empty archives problem, the right to be forgotten problem. So non-human creation. This handsome guy 
is Naruto. Naruto took this selfie. A photographer left his camera down. Naruto picked it up, took this beautiful picture, and the photographer made a ton of money. The people for the ethical treatment of animals sued the photographer on behalf of Naruto, saying that Naruto's copyright had been violated because copyright accrues to the creator at the moment of creation. He lost because US courts are never going to give rights to animals on that level. But the Naruto case points to this bigger question that's um, starting to arise with blockchains. If your transactions are being verified by a completely automatic system, who's liable if it goes wrong? Right now, if someone screws up my, uh, if a notary messes up my real estate transaction, I can sue that notary. What happens if the blockchain gets my land transaction wrong? Who do I sue? Who is liable? Who has power? Who has authority and control? We also have these intelligent agents, and this is kind of a scary thing out there, especially because we're seeing AIs and blockchains start to be combined. And we put a lot of power in North America into artificial intelligence. Right now, we let AIs decide who gets parole, uh, who will get a mortgage, which teachers keep their job and which teachers get fired. We let them decide who gets a job. We let them decide who gets to have access to credit to buy a house. Uh, or to further their education, because of course we like to make everyone pay for everything as much as we possibly can in my country. And the problem is that we can't necessarily look under the hood and see how these systems are making their decisions. So we heard Celia talking earlier about the training data. Here's the problem with training data. Who makes the training data? Where does it come from? Does anyone know? Do data sets emerge from the ground? No. Someone out there makes the training data. People, there's no such thing as raw data. Data is collected and um, classified and made available for these systems to use by people. And what they found is that people kind of suck. We can be racist, we can be sexist, and even if we're not purposefully building these things into these systems, what we get are racist, sexist results. So Amazon tried an artificial intelligence algorithm for their hiring. Who do you think the um, AI decided should be hired? What kinds of people? White men. And do you know why? Because historically, Amazon had only hired white men. And so, even though no one purposefully told the data to only hire white men, the data showed that historically, white men had been hired. And so in that case, you have a pretty clear argument that Amazon has liability, Amazon has control, Amazon created this AI. That's their problem. What happens when you have an AI on a blockchain? When you have this thing out making decisions over which either tens of thousands of people or no one has control. And from a records perspective, whose records are those? How do we keep those records in their context so that we can understand them as evidence? And then we have the role of data subject rights. For a long time, especially in the archival profession, we've just kind of ignored the fact that data subjects exist as individuals with rights. You know, the records belong to the creator, end of story, let's all go home. We're starting to see now, through this process of access and aggregation, that records are really powerful. Once upon a time, it didn't really matter what it said in, you know, your records at the Department of Motor Vehicles outside of very limited context because it was too much of a pain to go get everyone's records. They sat in a file clerk's cabinet somewhere and were kept obscure. This was called privacy through obscurity. But what happens with digitization? 
Now these things are dumped out there and they're made public for very good reasons. Court records are public records in my country because we want to be able to see what the courts are doing and hold them accountable because for goodness sakes, they can throw people in jail. But what's happening instead is that your records and my records and Jim Bob's records down the street are being pulled from these huge batches of digitized public records and mined for our data, stripped of all context, and being used to put together these dossiers on private citizens that would have made the KGB proud. And they are by far not always accurate. I have spent the last 20 years of my life trying to get the credit reporting agencies to disaggregate my file from my brother's file because our names are one letter apart and we had the same address. Never mind that we have different birthdays. I'm a woman, he's a man. Nope, we are the same person as far as the credit reporting agencies are concerned because they have huge amounts of access to cheap data and very little incentive to be careful or to do anything about it. We also have this idea, and I think you see it in the GDPR as well as in North America, of what's called privacy self-management. If you just give data subjects more power over their records, then I can go and tell Amazon and I can go and tell Google, I don't like what you're doing with my records, pull them, get rid of them, protect my privacy. The problem with that is it's not just Amazon and Google. There are enormous networks of data brokers working in the background. Facebook has data on millions of people who have never been Facebook users because they buy it. And how are you and I going to know who these people even are to go get our records back? On the flip side, the data that we should be keeping, the records we do need for transparency's sake, in order to hold those people who have power over us private citizens accountable, is being quietly shielded away under, oops, privacy. And we get from Malcolm Todd this empty archives prediction. Eventually, you're going to see records completely stripped of their ability to serve as records. What happens if all of the names are stripped of a record? How do we know who the persons were who participated in it? How do you prove the authority of such a record? We might end up with lots of paper and lots of data and zero ability to provide that foundation for future decision making. And so I see really two possible blockchain futures. And I think they're actually happening simultaneously. And that's because blockchain has been put out there as a record keeping technology with two promises. One, it's this incredibly privacy protecting technology. That's why we're using it for things like genetic data. Two, blockchain is going to make everything transparent and save us all from you know, evil actors because we'll be able to see what they're doing. In reality, I fear that we're going to end up with the worst of both worlds if we aren't very proactive about how this technology advances. So one of the problems that I see a lot, and I like to call it the Inigo Montoya problem, because in The Princess Bride, Inigo Montoya turns to his boss, who says, inconceivable, every time something that seems unlikely has already happened, and says, you keep using this word. I do not think it means what you think it means. We very much have this problem with blockchain as a record-keeping technology, and with some fundamental rights problems like privacy and transparency. So when you look at blockchain solutions, a lot of them put themselves out there as notarial. And in North America, they don't get it as much. You guys being in a civil law context, you are not a notary unless you have notarial power from the state. You're time stamping. Blockchains are not notaries, blockchains time stamp. That's a big important difference. You see them too calling themselves archiving solutions except they don't preserve records. They don't have any way of ensuring that records remain accessible for the future. You see all of this hype put out about blockchains without any real consideration as to what the word means and the importance of those words to the role of records in the broader society. We also see it happening a lot with the idea of privacy. Privacy in North America basically means data protection. We have no equivalent to what would probably be better termed something like intime in the French. 
It doesn't exist in North America. But at the same time, you're seeing privacy be pulled out to try to protect so many fundamental rights that are being lost in surveillance capitalism. It's become a code word for autonomy, for intellectual freedom, for freedom of relationship, for freedom from and freedom to. We don't even really know what privacy means other than I want some right against all the bad things that are being done against me. We have the same thing happening with transparency. You see a lot of transparency ideas out there when it comes to things like open government, open data. If we just make it all available to people, then we'll be able to hold back the actors accountable. We'll be able to fix problems with government. Corruption will be a thing of the past and we'll all go down the street singing. In reality, what I found in my research on the blockchain is that when people talk about blockchain as this fundamentally transparent thing, what they mean is it's a transparent, it has technical transparency. With blockchain, all of the record or all of the data that has been on the blockchain is there forever. You can't hide a record in the blockchain. But availability is a far cry from accessibility. System transparency is when we can understand how things work. So, for example, we have Freedom of Information Acts throughout most North American jurisdictions. And that basically means I can request a government record, and if they have records that match what I'm requesting, they have to give it to me, you know, absent certain reasonable ex exceptions, like, um, you know, they can't give me someone's private information without redacting it. In reality, despite having these kinds of acts, we've seen in British Columbia, our premier's office resort to government by post-it note in order to avoid creating records. We had the uh, Ministry of Transportation had a specific res records request for records pertaining to um, what they call the Highway of Tears, which is where countless uh, indigenous women have been murdered or gone missing. And so a clerk there found the records responsive to the Freedom of Information request. His boss went over, deleted it, deleted it again from the recycle, and then went into the server and deleted it. That's why we call it the triple delete scandal. And this particular clerk had the moral fortitude, the character, to make this public. But only about 25% of records requests in British Columbia are ever found to have responsive records. So how transparent is the system, even if we have the idea that the records are at least available and theoretically legally accessible, there's still human intervention. And finally, one of the big problems we have is when we're talking about blockchains that are technically transparent, people hear it as this idea of democratic transparency. This idea that by having the records available, we will be able to go forth and avail ourselves as citizens, that it's a lack of available information that keeps us from participating and keeps our systems broken. At best, that is naive because it greatly underestimates, A, the complexity that goes into the record-keeping technologies behind a society, and B, it greatly underestimates what people need beyond mere accessibility of records to use those records effectively. Hmm. So, the future needs us. And by us, I mean records professionals. I mean archivists. I mean people who understand at the core of their beings why records matter so much. And I know, when I tell people that what I do, that I'm an archivist, they're like, really? You need a PhD to do that? Yes, I do, because we need that foundation for future decision making, and it's not going to happen. We have already lost countless records from the 1980s and 1990s due to obsolescence. Uh, Salman Rushdie has donated his archives to Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. So far, they've spent at least $3 million US trying to recover his records from some old Apple Macs because he's Salman Rushdie and it's worth it. What's been lost in our heritage that will never be recovered because it's not worth it? 
to spend the money, to spend the technical expertise to try to combat obsolescence. And when these blockchain systems are being built, the technologists are not thinking in the scale of, in 2,000 years, we might need to be able to see the cadastres in order to prove the rights of title that this land has. They're thinking, this is a really cool thing, and look what I can make it do tomorrow. <laughs> the time scale in the technologist world is a year. The time scale in our world is until the record is no longer needed. And that is a perspective that is desperately missing. I feel that we, as archivists, as records professionals, have a moral obligation to make sure that the future is better than the past, that we assert the need to ensure that these technological archi architectures don't overtake the democratic, legal, social roles of records and archives. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. Bé, si teniu alguna pregunta, si us plau, aixequeu la mà i a veure si us veig des d'aquí. Alguna pregunta, no questions? No? I'm not sensitive, I promise. Well, Dara, I have a few questions. For sure. What do you think about the role of archivist? Maybe you explain here. But do you think we have uh, we need some technological competencies in our? I think for sure there is as much as the technologists need to develop what I would call archival competence. They need to understand what they are what designing these systems to do at a much higher level. We also need the technological com technological competence to come to the table and to make that argument and also understand their side. So um, part of what I do is I take this work out and I go and I explain the archival bond and provenance at computer science conferences. And invariably there's always one guy who comes up and goes, do you even know what a packet is? And I have my chops, and I can say, yes, do you understand how uh, public key infrastructure works? So yes, not everyone needs to be a blockchain expert. We don't, I don't, our archivists don't need to go out and be cryptographers. That's not who we are, that's not what we do. But when we're using these systems, we have to understand them well enough to be able to look at under the hood and see how it does or doesn't meet the needs of archives and records. And another one, finally. Uh, what do you expect in five years from blockchain to records manager or digital preservation? Uh, for digital preservation? Yeah. Okay, so blockchain... Five years vista. Pardon? Five years. Uh, go. Five years down the road. Blockchain is absolutely fantastic for ensuring the integrity of records. <laughs> I will give it that. Ensuring the integrity of records is a far cry from preserving a record. It, blockchains can't do anything to make records reliable. They don't, you know, assure that the, there was the proper authority to create the record. They can't change the um, context of creation with the exception of records that are born on the chain. Uh, so I think that blockchains will be used in conjunction with broader archival solutions as sort of an integrity checking system in digital pre preser preservation. I can talk. Okay, thank you. Ningún tengo que preguntar más. No. Ah, sí. Marta. It's very interesting to know about it uh, because uh, we are uh, a little afraid and we have a little confusion about uh, how uh, blockchain uh, really works. And it's uh, an easy way to understand your presentation. And uh, in Canada, mm -hmm. you are using uh, blockchain and there is a, a, a strategic a government strategy to to make blockchain into the government. Yes. Uh, uh, how do you uh, expect to work with this strategy of the government? Because governments always think that this is the future and they have to use it. They uh, the records management and archivists are worried about it. Are they? working with the government in these strategies or? Yes, so um, Dr. Victoria Lemieux, with whom I work, is just a complete bundle of energy. And so she has made it part of her life's mission to basically go out and find where these blockchain initiatives are happening in Canada. And she's right there. 
So the International Standards Organization is creating a blockchain standard. And the, our blockchain at UBC team has had people on the ground from day one because we want to make sure that that archival perspective is represented. The BC government, you know, we've been working hand in hand with their people to make sure the blockchain or the archival perspective is represented. Muy bien. Pues fins aquí. Eh, uh, las gracias a Dara. Thank you Dara for coming. Ah, uh, y aplaudimen. Y ya está.